where I can, I've, I've tried to point to words where that's a, a particularly appropriate or the um, where it's relevant to, to the LC. Uh, what I've done is if you have access to a, a second device, like your mobile, if you're accessing this in a computer and you've got your mobile at hand, you can scan the QR code there and join in on the Jamboard. And what I've also done is I'm just going to pop that into the chat as well um, so that you can access it either way. Um, I hear that um, Whiteboard and Microsoft has got a wee bit of an overhaul, so I don't know if that's why it wasn't working for me this morning. Definitely a wee bit of resilience there. The Microsoft Whiteboard tool in Teams wasn't working, so I've just jumped to the Google version. Um, whether or not you have a Google sign-in, um, that's, that's, um, that should match you should be able to access that and edit the, the Jamboard. It's just a whiteboard. Um, I've put some points on it that I'd like you to have a wee think about as we go. Um, that wee black bit that always appears at the top of your screen. Nobody knows what it does, why it's there, or how to get rid of it, but it's there. So, um, so this is a Jamboard here. You can see, I can see already there's folk joined in. Uh, and all I'm going to ask you to do is um, using post-its, um, uh, we'll go for uh, green at the top. So uh, things we like about children online. And we'll do things that we don't like. We don't like the thought of them doing online. So greens at the top for positives, red at the bottom for negatives there. So what children do online that's what we're going to talk through um this afternoon so you can pop your thoughts onto that jam board um while you're doing that i'll just tell you a wee bit a quick overview of what we're going to do in the session and uh, we're going to talk about this first bit here the need for children and young people to be cyber resilient and what that means for them um i'll share with you some key themes and some ideas and i suppose i want a better word the sort of branding the, the messaging that we have from Education Scotland on how to support children, young people with cyber resilience and internet safety and indeed their families too. It's really important that, that we engage the whole family. Uh, can do your best with the children, but uh, if their families are, are away off uh, track and, and doing something totally different, that's not going to join up. Um, and the last part, I'll share you some resources um, and information you can quickly access. Um, so if you've you got something, if you wanted to teach something about cyber resilience, internet safety tomorrow, I've got a toolkit that you can access um, today and you'll be able to pick out a resource that you could use tomorrow. Although I know um, if they have far more planning uh, in place than, than than doing things off the, you know, planning it today for tomorrow. But I know we are responsive. So if you've got to come up with something tomorrow, there's loads of resources there um, to support you with that. So let's go pop onto the jam board and see if anybody's got anything on here. Nothing on so far. Um, what I can show you though is what they, they did earlier today. So here are some of the things about what children do online. So whether it's learning songs, nursery rhymes, they might be researching things. Um, there's platforms such as YouTube that are always going to come up. YouTube is the second biggest search engine, second most used search engine in the world. Um, the biggest being Google, which... which um, owns YouTube, so whether or not you use YouTube or Google, if you want to find out how to do something or find information, um, the main place that people on this planet do that is Google. Um, so you could say that Google owns, the, they're certainly the gatekeepers of that data and information, whether they own it or not. Um, last time, you know, I fitted a dishwasher recently, I didn't go down the library and get a book about fitting dishwashers. You guessed it, I went on YouTube and I found that information. Our children, young people do the same. You want to learn something, you YouTube it in most cases. So, um, there's things that we don't like about that. There's inappropriate content. It might not be age-specific um, ads or pop-ups and things that we see. And there's um, the, a babysitting tool, absolutely, and, and social media there. So, Spending too much time. So that's lots of the stuff that people shared with me. The smaller's pop back and see if MD's popped some stuff up there. It's it's too big. Um so if that's referring to the, the internet in general or, or certain apps. The access to stories and songs, extending learning, yep, keep in touch with people, loads there coming through. So access to stuff, access to everything. Uh, if I'm right, in the last 20 years, um or so 20, 25 years, we've generated more data. Um, and knowledge than we ever have in the whole existence of of, of everything um, in our known history of the planet and the universe. But as far as we know, 
um, everything on this planet, we've generated more knowledge in the last 20 years than we have in the, the, the millions, hundreds of millions of years that the planet has been here. So that's quite astronomical. So you want to find out something, chance are you going to find it out online. Um, the the reason then, the need for that, the, the need for the cyber resilience and the internet safety, it's going to pop up to full screen here. Um, like uh, our friends here, I always think it's really important to take precautions. Hopefully we don't need them. Uh, we certainly do need to take um, security and safety precautions in our online world or our real world. You know, you probably lock your door before you, you go to sleep at night. Uh, make sure all the windows are, are locked and, and closed, etc. But me, I don't feel like me. I probably click my car button two or three times just to make sure I definitely did lock it when I pressed the button there. Um, so we, we take all these other security precautions, um, and I think it's really important we consider that in our digital and online world as well, that we, we take care of things, we keep them as safe as we can, um, just in case, um, like Joey here with the bubble wrap, so always worth taking those precautions. But just the scale of it here, I think these these um, stats hopefully help you, you get an understanding of that if you, if you didn't already have it. And perhaps you think tablets and internet are just a wee thing, you know, literacy and numeracy are right up there. That's the, the things and the skills and the knowledge that our children and young people need for growing up and living a happy, wholesome life. But um, and the internet's just a wee part of that. It's just a wee thing they do. It's a hobby, you know, gaming. It's, it's down there beside, you know, below things like football and painting and reading. Um, but in actual fact, if you look at the numbers there, you see that it's, it's right up there as one of the most important things that any of us do in our lives um, every day. These figures have come from the Ofcom 2021 online, um, our online lives, our online media report. Really, really detailed, big, um, big data set in there. So, um, pretty accurate, uh, or fair representations of the, the the nation. You can see there, nearly every adult uses the internet. Um, you can discount, you know, things whether you might want to say, oh, if people are homeless, they maybe don't have access. But again, you can be homeless and access a mobile phone. Uh, accessing the internet through the mobile phone. Um, there'll be people because of their beliefs or their age, perhaps. Uh, that, so there are people you can probably say there's a category, there's a category that, that, that won't, which makes just about every other um, sort of mainstream adult um, means that they're accessing the internet. The number of hours per day that um, an adult uses is 3.4 on children. You know, 7 and 8 is the youngest age group that they've got the data for that. And it's it's just about the same. It's not far away at all. So um, I don't think this isn't some sort of gradual slippery slope where children, you know, start to use a wee bit of the internet, and then you know when they're 15, they're, they're using as much as an adult. Almost from the off, they jump straight in at the deep end, and they're they're using the same amount of internet as much as adults are. So it's not something they gradually do a wee bit more of, like drinking tea. This is something that they, they just dive straight in, like drinking four or five cups of tea a day like an adult would. Um, and for me, that makes it really different from a lot of other behaviours that we, we we learn and we develop as we, we grow up. They're, they're gradual, they're things that we, we learn to do. We, we, we gradually slide into habits. With internet, we are straight in at the deep ends, I say. <sighs> Interesting to know if you think 80% is high or low um, ownership for three to four-year-olds. Um Personally, I'd say I think that's probably in the, the, the conservative. That's probably in the low side there. Uh, I would be imagining nearly nearly every um, three to four year old has access to a tablet of some sort, um, whether that's new, pre-owned, latest, up to spec, iPad Pro 10, or you know they've got you know a, a four year old Kindle Fire. They've probably got access to something somewhere. And again, you see those figures there. Nearly 90 percent are watching YouTube. Um, Predominantly at that age, it's it's like others, um, like other older users, it's for funny pranks and jokes, comes in as being the most watched, and then it's cartoons and music videos. That's what children and young people are watching YouTube for. So you can guess what children and young people are up to. We can look at the date and see what they're actually up to. The best way to find out what they're up to is to speak to them um, and find out what they say they do, because we can take all these stats and say 90%, so that means... Nine out of the ten children in your setting are watching YouTube. It may actually be ten out of ten in your setting, or it could be two out of ten for whatever that cultural um, value is that makes it slightly different where you are in your setting um, from somewhere else. Um, slightly different cultural capital to that set. The connection is loose on my second screen. It's frustrating my life out because it keeps turning off my second screen. I'm just going to 
unplug that. I had that earlier as well. So we, we talked about the need then. We've identified that there is a need for cyber resilience internet safety. We use it. We use the internet more than for well, more than ever. It's it's you know, we've been using the web until 1994. So um, as I say, it's, it's, it's like our house. It makes sense to protect our house. So we should be protecting the things that we do online as well. We split that down in Scottish education to two parts, but two parts are the same thing. We've got cyber resilience and we've got internet safety. The really easy way, um, try to do it pictorially there, um, cyber resilience relates to the devices and the platform. So your laptop can be bullied, um, your Facebook account cannot be um, scammed for money. The devices and platforms, they are inanimate. It's the, but they can be hacked. Um, they can be broken into and they can have viruses put onto them, for example. Um, the person, on the other hand, when we talk about internet safety, they can be bullied, um, but they cannot be hacked yet. Um, although, get another 10, 15 years, um, maybe you could be hacked and plugging yourself into the matrix and things. So, it's always a wee bit fluid. One can impact the other. If you've got really poor cyber resilience, then that will have a knock-on effect on your internet safety. And we believe if we if we set the devices and the platforms up as safely and securely as possible in the first place, then that's going to mitigate the, the risk of internet safety um, impacts such as bullying. Um, the example I would give you with the, that's probably the most appropriate for, for the, the most likely harm for, for most people is um, if you set up your social media, so let's say you're setting up your Twitter account, um, it will by default, it will allow anyone to direct message you. So anyone can send you a message directly to your inbox. Um, and quite often that includes um, nude pictures, nude images of people's genitalia seems to be very popular on social media. So without ever asking for that, you can be sent an image of that, um, particularly distressing if you're you know, thinking about children, young people receiving that. But by getting into the settings um, on your, your your social media, particularly um, I tell you for, for Twitter, it's in the security and privacy settings. You can set it that only people you've friended are allowed to direct message you. So that automatically gets rid of you know bots or random people online that for whatever reason they've decided to send you that picture, that nude image. That gets rid of a lot of the randomness there. Um, it still means that, that people that you're friends with and that you follow can send you those types of images that you've perhaps not requested. So it doesn't get rid of all the internet safety issues, but it certainly reduces the chance, the scope for that impact in you. If somebody you know is sending you the types of images, then I think you've got a different, um, a different scenario, a different situation from some random or a bot where, where the computer is randomly generating and sending these images to random people. So very different um, aspects there. If, if we set our account up, um, if we've got a password on our device, we're using two-factor authentication where you try to log into your emails and it asks you to log in in your phone app um, as a secondary bit of um, security, that keeps it um, safer. Um, less at risk from outside um, influences like hackers getting access to our content and our devices or platforms, but also that wee bit of cyber resilience um, about the way we set the device and the platform up can reduce the likelihood of some of those internet safety risks. Um, however, you can have the best, most safe and secure um, Facebook profile and you might still be groomed by somebody who makes communication with you. Um, flatters you, you know, starts to generate um, some empathy and a, a rapport with you and then leads down to a, a request for either sexual gratification or monetary gain. So you can still be groomed even though you get the, the most safe and secure um, online platform. So it's not foolproof, but it certainly reduces some of those risks. For us, we want you to, to help us share these messages. So we'll talk about devices. It's about recognising the risk to the device or the platform or the person using it through the device of the platform to be able to react to that. So if, if somebody has tried to hack into your Facebook account, that you react to that by changing your password, you report that to Facebook, or if it's a scam, somebody's trying to fish money from you or hit you with ransomware on your device, you know, a virus or, or some malware, then um, you report that to the police and the National Cyber Security Centre. So there's, there's bits to know. 
Um, and then the, the last few parts of that recovery, um, hopefully you never need to, but you've got everything backed up that's important to you. And again, I think that's something that's worth right down to young children, make sure that they've got a backup of things that are important to them. So um, in, in the olden days, you know, I had, had photographs printed off at Boots um, or Click, and uh, they were in a big poly bag uh, in my mum's house. And that meant somebody would have to break into my house to, to delete those images. Um, however, if I have all my images on my phone and I lose my phone and my phone's hacked or stolen and I lose all those photographs that are dear to me, unless I've backed them up, they're gone. Forget it. I'm never getting them back. So really important, again, if we talk to children, young people, that there are steps they can take. They can set things up to recover from a harm before they happen. Again, bubble wrap around the head. We're taking that precaution. In terms of internet safety, it's the behaviour of the person online and the behaviour of others towards them. We just want that message really simple. Be safe, be smart, be kind. And I'd love it if children and young people were grown up in a country where, like the Green Cross codes, you know, every time they go to do anything online, they ask themselves, is this safe? Is it smart? Is it kind? Um, and if everybody took that approach, then there would be less and less and hopefully no internet safety um, harms or risks. But that's Again, idealistic, but that's where we'd like to see it go. We're going to promote those positives. Um, so now we bit I've spoken quite a bit there, but I think it's really important to understand the way those two messages or those two parts of the same message fit together. I wanted to go into the jam board again. Um, you can uh, the the link should be in the chat there if you're ready to go to open. And tell me there's some starters for 10 here on the page, but what are children and young people's first experiences with digital technology and exploring that online world? So what's that that for you? So um, that's on page two. Um, again, you can go good and bad if you want to. You can just put them up. They can be agnostic, you know, whether they're just using things and, and you've got no opinion if it's good or bad. But um, if you want to pop some more ideas onto that jam board um, and we'll just see what people think are the first online experiences that children have. Um, and it doesn't have to be in your setting, that could be at home, just anywhere in their life. It could be out at the shops, you know, wherever you think they have an online experience. Um, and we'll just get a wee kind of a feel for the room, I think is always useful. Yep, so we get mum's mobile or an adult's mobile. Um, so they get a mobile um, device, get given that from a, a very young age. It'd be interesting to know whoever wrote that. What age What age do you think is normal? Um, not positive or negative, just what do you think is a societal norm? What think, age do you think we start giving children mobile phones to look at? While we're thinking if it helps, uh, I'll pop you up some from earlier as well. So we get things like... Yep, that was it. So using things like TikTok and social media, video call and family members, they've got things like Alexa and Google Home or other smart devices are available and um, got those spread around the house. Um, so they're getting stories online, um, digital content on the TV. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I know um, Louise spoke earlier, and I believe you're speaking again this afternoon, Louise, about computer science and that understanding of where computers are in our life. Um, just got a new TV at the weekend there and, and setting it up probably took um, longer than setting up my first PC. Um, the number of accounts and things I had to sign up and connect, I might as well have had a, a CD drive on the side to install Windows on it. Um, so yeah, your, your computer's a big telly. Um, and, and if we can understand that and get that to our children and young people to work with, then that helps them um, navigate that. If you, if you can appreciate that your TV, if it's a smart TV, it's effectively just a big tablet or a big Android mobile phone. Um, it works in the same operating system as your phone. Um, you can download apps and use it the same way you can use your phone. So it's really just like a big version of your phone um, stuck to the wall. Um, in terms of the, the way that they're using it, if somebody in the last one put up baby monitor. Um, so these baby monitors are now connected to apps and things. So right from the, the day dot, right from the second they're born, children have got a camera stuck monitoring them. Um, you can call that a baby monitor, but what if we take away the word baby and we talk about monitoring or surveilling our children from a very young age? At what age does that become um, a privacy concern? Do you know, is it all right to monitor your 15-year-old son or daughter? 
on a video camera, would they appreciate that? What are the concerns around that? Things like ring doorbell, somebody mentioned Alexa earlier and, and ring doorbell, I think was mentioned too. You got a ring doorbell, um, which is increasingly um, been reported to have a, a negative impact, particularly on, on, on women um, in abusive relationships, where um, if I've got a ring doorbell, I can go in and access um, the feed from the day and I can find out exactly when my wife came home from work. Um, and if that doesn't match up with what she's telling me, I can start to um, ask her questions about, you said you came in at five, I was on the ring doorbell, you didn't get in till, till seven. So there are bits, you know, eth huge ethical concerns there about all the devices that we have access to, but if we are constantly, you know, we, we from, from birth, we're putting a, a video monitor on our children and that's normal, then is it, um, how do they learn to question that when somebody's videoing surveilling them as an adult so big big questions certainly know the sort of stuff we're maybe going to discuss but i wanted to kind of keep those in mind that we've got to think of that bigger picture when we start to talk about what's normal and um, there yep yeah, on the social media parents social media quite a, a, an often one i would always ask is what age do you think children first um get exposed to being online when did they send their first image um or the first image it's shared to them and it's probably even you know when um mum or dad or that find out about you know the um, find out that they're pregnant, they post a picture of the, the tummy on Facebook, they keep an ongoing um, record of that on their social media. So children are being posted online before they're even born. So again, it might sound quite abstract, uh, some of the, you know, if I'm taking these through to their kind of nth degree, but again, if, worth bearing in mind that it starts off with songs and content and the telly, but all of a sudden their whole life is interconnected and it's worth just having a wee think about what is normal and, and what should they be seen. Um, yep, there's photos of children and babies on social media, as I've seen there. So, um, lots to consider then about where they start to see it and, and where they go with that. Um, and I always think to, to always take it through at that last point that, you know, what, what could the harm be here? So, it's fine that they're being monitored or they're sharing the images with their granny on WhatsApp. Where could that lead to? Um, thankfully, it's, it's a wee bit easier in terms of what we teach them. Um, with the curriculum in mind, there's, there's only two parts you have to teach. So in cyber resilience and internet safety, which is in the technologies curriculum under digital literacy, there's one experience and outcome, but there's two parts that make it up. It's appropriate behaviour and language, that's internet safety, and there's the importance of passwords and passcodes, that's your cyber resilience part. So as long as our children are, are coming out of the early years with an understanding of the importance of passwords and they're aware of what isn't, isn't appropriate online, then that's that's great. And again, it's really we'll come in um, the next slide. We'll look at the kind of internet safety aspect of that, about what is and isn't appropriate, how they behave online, what you can expect from that. But for just a wee second here, it, it isn't even about being able to make secure passwords, it's about understanding the need for it. So you can see here a kind of spectrum of where they might see security measures in their life going from, and, and I really like the mathematical approach, a concrete, pictorial, and abstract. And I think it's it's the part that the ELC staff are, are, are so masters of um, more than more than teachers very often is, is that real life, what happens in that child's life and making that real, making that the teachable moment. Um, so you can ask for the examples that where they see passwords and passcodes and security settings. That's a locker when they go swimming. It's the having to put a pound in the trolley when they go shopping. It might be that there's an intercom for the school, the nursery, or might live in some flats and they've got an intercom, might go and visit their granny and grand and sheltered housing. They've got, again, intercom systems there. So all of these providing a barrier to keep something safe and secure, that information that's held within them. Again, similar to with, with, with bikes, we might want to lock them up so they don't get stolen. We want to put a passcode or a fingerprint or even the laptop I'm using to present will we'll scan my face um, to unlock it. So these aren't sci-fi, it's not a minority port, it's no Star Wars or Robocop here we're talking about, it's, it's things that are everyday use. So if we are still talking about passwords and, you know, being a, the, the only thing to unlock stuff, that's no realistic and it's no relevant or reflective of the life that children live. They will be familiar with fingerprint scanners and face IDs. So again, it's something we should consider um, discussing with them about where these things um, happen where they take place and, and how they work and how they're used and that leads in particularly the kind of um, the biometric stuff the fingerprints the face um, facial recognition starts to lead into that computing science aspect that, that Louise is, um, will speak about so 
as long as we're talking to children and young people, they're aware of all the different things in their life that they, they use and they see or they see adults around them using passwords, passcodes, and the need for things to be secure. And if you want to make that thing that we don't want somebody to walk away when we're swimming um, or, or, or our clothes when we're at the swimming, we come out, we've got to walk home in our wet swimming trunks and a towel, um, we put it in a locker and we keep that safe and secure. Same as our most treasured, valued images and videos or games, we put them somewhere safe and secure online and we, we protect them with passwords, fingerprints and two-factor authentication. Um, in terms of resources and teaching this week, we've got um, our online uh, our website, we've got digilearn.scot, I'm just going to pop that open. There is a whole section in here, if you get into professional learning, you'll see there's a whole section on um, ELC here that might be useful for you, but for just now, I want to show you a cyber resilience site. And when it comes to that internet safety aspect of um, appropriate behaviour and language, what are children, people, you know, children and young people do and what's appropriate to them. The only way you can really get that is to talk to them and find out what they're doing. Now, what they're doing online will fall into one of three categories we've, we've established. It's either consume, create or communicate. We've been around the houses with this and we, we, we cannot think of another behaviour something that you can do online that doesn't fit under consume, create, communicate. Create's a wee bit funny because we can capture images and videos on our devices and they're fairly safe and secure. They don't pose much risk with us until we start to share them and that comes into the communicate part. So it's a bit of a spectrum here. We feel there's, there's more risk at communicate because there's other people involved. Whereas when you're creating and consuming, you're the only person doing or using that at, at your end. Um, and that therefore carries a bit less risk. It's still risk free, but it's less risky. Watching a video on YouTube is less risky than making a video and posting it on YouTube. And then when we post it publicly and other people start to comment and communicate about our post, that carries greater risk than simply watching a video. That's how we've come up with that, that kind of um, this teacher toolkit. So the idea being is you can come to our Digital Learn Scott site, go to Cyber Resilience Internet Safety, and when you're working out how you're going to support your children and young people, you've already worked out, you've asked them what do they do online, and they've told you, and you're able to categorise that as either consume, create, or communicate. Now, some things like a platform such as YouTube, you might think, well, that comes in under all three, and we've um, recognise that. So if you go in under consume, create, communicate, you'll see video under each one of those. Most likely for children and, and young people you're working with, it will be a, a consumption, will, will be the, the most likely. They, they may well be communicating, um, but the chances are the most of what they're doing online is consuming. So you can read all this here. This is just what I'm telling you anyway. So you come to here and we've split it up into these different behaviours that we consume online. So if I take social media, for example, if I'm reading social media content, that carries a really different risk from me to me from gambling. I can't lose money by reading posts on social media. I cannot have uh, my bank details stolen by watching a video on social media. I might be getting lied to. I might be seeing something that's um, not true. It might be false reporting or fake news. I might see um, images which are not truly representative of the people creating them, and that might have an impact on my body image. Um, those are risks from social media, but there are no risks necessarily from searching the internet or reading. So we've tried to split it up on that because if you're specific about the behaviours they're doing, we hope we can help you um, understand the specifics of, of that behaviour. So most likely, I'm going to go statistically, 80% of children, um, 3 to 5, are watching YouTube. And what we've done in that page is, you see there's a recording here um, about information literacy and how we can support our children and young people become better at understanding, analysing and evaluating. And that might seem, um, you know, we, I maybe wouldn't be expecting my three-year-olds to be evaluating um, information sources online, but I'm starting to introduce that part where they're thinking about what they're watching. So um, the risks here, we've, we've tried to outline some of the risks here in the bullet points, so what might be the problem, I suggest already there, fake reporting, uh, or false reporting, fake news, and uh, even just getting children and young people to start to think about what am I watching and is this true? Um, so if I'm watching the, the new Thomas the Tank Engine series, Thomas and Friends, is that representative of trains in the real world? 
and, and there's a part that I understand even for children, young people, it's not. It was obviously the classic um, Thomas Tank Engine series was was far more uh, reflective of, of real life trains. So quite a deep chat if you're having that with children, and young people. But it's that idea we want them to understand things that are real, things that aren't. And again, not everything we see online um, can be trusted. We've put steps here that you probably need to teach to them about cyber resilience. Um, it's well worth thinking about whether they have an account or not. So even if that's a, a kid's YouTube account or, or even if it's an adult's YouTube account, simply by having an account set up to access that content makes it safer. Not safe, but safer. If I've got a YouTube account, it tracks what I watch and it makes suggestions to me based on what I've watched. So if I watch loads of Thomas the Tank, as we currently do in our household, then it's going to recommend me more Thomas the Tank Engine videos. Whereas if I'm watching boxing, it's going to recommend boxing videos to me. So if it's going to recommend things based on what I watch. Again, whether it's a YouTube Kids account would be recommended, or even just another you know, vanilla version, full adult content of YouTube, a child would still be better having their own YouTube account than watching one that's shared with an adult because that adult might be watching stuff that's inappropriate. It's going to become recommendations for children, young people. If I don't have an account at all, YouTube's just going to recommend me all kinds of things um, based on what's popular on YouTube, and that might be inappropriate to my age and stage. So having an account's a good step. Um, so that's the kind of stuff we'll have here in Cyber Resilience. Under Internet Safety, we'll have probably more um, just stuff to discuss, so questions to ask your children. So why might somebody make a fake Thomas the Tank Engine video with swear words in it? Why would somebody do that? Because that might be a, a harm that they've recognised. They might have watched a YouTube video with, with their favourite children's character swearing. Why somebody made that? And again, start to have discussions about why that might be there or, or steps that they can take to, to um, avoid that. We've then split it. The last few part here is resources. So these are things you can actually use. Um, so it might have to be teacher led if you're working with younger learners there. And um, they're certainly going to write in that worksheet. But that YouTube moving image education activity is just about finding a YouTube video that they like and then asking who made it? When was it made? Why do you think they made it? Why do you think they included the information they did? So start to introduce that information, let's just say, for younger children. Um, and getting them to become aware of when things are or aren't appropriate to them. Um, and the last few part here is really useful for yourself or for sharing with families. Um, we've sort of tried to pick our favourite ones, that the ones we thought were the most relevant or the most informative. Here's your information about watching YouTube content. So there's millions of information about YouTube online, but if you want to be um, stuff that we've tried to just, um, I suppose, I suppose sift through some of that for you and pick out the ones that we thought were the most useful. So if you need to know more than what we've got on this wee page, here's your links to, to further reading. And, and that's the idea behind that, that teacher toolkit. We want educators to be able to come here. I, I'm dealing with children, young people who've, who've done a lot of consuming, they're playing lots of games. I can come here and I can see information about consuming games. And if they were communicating on games, I can be able to go in through, communicate. It's not quite finished that page off there. And you'll see very similar menu, gaming, social media, and there'll be specific information resources to communicate online because communicating in a game is different from consuming a game. Two different behaviours, there's two different sections there. There's also, you see here, um, a, a link to a specific ELC page, which has got some recorded webinars and some further information, but that's something you can explore yourself. You'll find that really useful as well. So that is the, the, the key message in there about the way that they behave online. It's either consume, create, or communicate. For your learners, it's most likely most of the behaviour will be consume, but there will be elements of create and communicate in there as well. Um, so those are the resources that I've got for you to take away. And I've put links into these slides. I'll, I'll share the slides with you, but everything that I've spoken about today is on our digilearn.scot website anyway. Um, and the last few bit I'm just going to get you to, to have a think about then in terms of consume, create, communicate. Um, on slide three of the, the jam board, on that third board, I wanted to have a wee think about what do we model? So not what you teach, not, not what the lessons are or what you're sharing with children and young people. But what do they just pick up from you or what do they pick up from their families um, that isn't explicit or overt? What types of behaviours are they learning from you? If you have a rethink about that just as a round off here. Um, 
So on these slides um, and on the website, there's links to the teacher toolkit that I've just shown you. Um, there's a the Google Internet Legends sort of curriculum, and um, you can access that on Go or, or just on online um, as well. It's free to use. There's lessons there, and it goes with the Interlands games, which are um, free to play online, and they're great for even younger children, sort of endless runner type games with um, not a lot of controls or, or dexterity required for playing those. So. Um, younger children can play them as well. And the last part is to have that consideration about if you're thinking to yourself, right, what do we do with this? Um, either that's great information, George, we need to have a think about that, or George, that's absolute nonsense. We're going to go from our own direction. Whichever you're taking away from today, um, there's the Digital Schools Award for Scotland. Um, they've got their own Cyber Resilience Internet Safety Special Recognition Award uh, or badge. And whether or not you think you're 50% you're, you're or 90% of the way there, I cannot recommend enough that you, you sign up for the Digital Skills Award um, and the Cyber Resilience Internet Safety Badge and you fill out the, the evaluation there because seeing if you score 30%, you know where you need to improve. Um, and it doesn't track or monitor you. You're not going to get an email saying you only get 30%, you failed. Um, it's about starting. It, it should be the first step in that pathway. So if you fill out that, special recognition for Cyber Resilience Internet Safety Award. What will point out to you the bits that you're doing well, and you're probably doing better than you think you are. You've probably already got most of the stuff in place, certainly in terms of policies and practices. Um, most often, I've found in my experience, it's always you've got one or two real keen beans that, that you know, on staff who are way ahead, that's their specialty. And it's maybe just about how you bring the rest of your staff up to speed in that journey. Like anything, you have somebody that's a specialist in nutrition, somebody that's your specialist in sports and movements. So there's, there's, somebody's always going to have the wee bit that they um, can enjoy the most and they, they lead on that. So that, that's the, the gap I quite often see is most places will have their, their policies and practices in place. It's about the bringing the, the, the rest of the team um, up to speed with that. But the, doing that evaluation will tell you where you need to go next. So you don't have to guess. You don't have to think, I bet we need to rewrite all our policies. And you start rewriting all your policies when in actual fact your policies were great. Um, it helps you to identify your needs. And I think that's really important. Then you can ask the likes of Pam or ourselves to come in and support with that. Um, and, and the Digital Schools Award um, It's just worth thinking about that as the, the, the start of your journey. Um, and the actual wee plaque you get is, is the kind of end of it. But it's about the, the start of the journey. So before I finish off, if we look, see, so there about the modelling, um, the example I would give to that is in, when I was in school, um, just as the bell rang, you know, most of my colleagues would have the, and it's not to criticise something, it's just an observation, most of my colleagues, if the children lined up ready to go for the bell ringing, they got their jackets, their, their play piece, and they're ready to go for an interval, and the teacher would get into their bag or their drawer, get their phone out, take children out to the playground, and then straight up to the staff room and they can use their phone. And it's not about the conduct here, it probably doesn't break any rules, but rather than take children out to the playground and then go back and get their device, for me what that is saying is the most important thing, I'm about to get a break, a bit of downtime, the most important thing to me is finding out what's been happening on my mobile phone. You know, do you do that um, in, in the, 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 the play or the classroom? Do you, as soon as you're going off for your break, do you go and get your phone? The children see you on your phone when you're on a break. Um, have you got your phone in your pocket and they can see that in your, your trousers or your jeans? Can they see that your phone's there? Are they aware of that sitting in a pocket in your, your jumper, your jacket, whatever you're wearing on top? Can they see that phone outline that's always saying to them, I need to have my phone near me at all times? Or have you got an Apple Watch or a, a, you know, an Android, a, a, a Google Watch, whatever they're called? Have you got one of these smart watches that every time somebody messages you, your phone, your phone lights up, you're watching, you have a wee look at it to see that message. Are you saying to them, every time somebody messages me, I need to look at that and see, I know we're here playing, but my phone's lit up and I need to look at that. Is that the message that you're conveying? So I'd always ask that we start at home, we always or start with ourselves. Um, what are you doing and what does that show children and young people? Do you have a post-it note for the password um, for the, the, the laptops, the PCs, whatever you've got? Is that stuck to the front of the monitor? Is that beside the smart board or the interactive board that you've got? So what do we do? Are we showing them the best example we can? And if you always wonder why when an iPad comes in, they'll rent it to get the shop first. Is that no similar to what we do as adults when we go and get our phone out of our pockets or our bags as soon as we've got the chance to? 
So again, rather than thinking that what they do is a really abstract thing, they've learned it from us as educators, they learn it from their family around them at home. Um, and it's definitely, I think, really important we think about that, um, what we are modeling to them. Um, because you know they don't make it up themselves. Um, so hopefully in this session, I've, I've, I've hopefully identified the, the need for cyber resilience and internet safety by children, young people need to set the devices platforms up. They need to be aware of these things, having security and privacy settings and the, the importance of setting them up. And it's better, um, at least if by the, say by the end of early level and they're going to first level, um, that they're aware of passwords and keeping things safe and secure and what is and isn't appropriate content. So if they see a sweary YouTube video, what should they do? Real practical advice. Um, I don't think we're going to fix the world overnight with these presentations. Um, we're not going to make everybody nice to each other on Twitter or Instagram. So the, all we can do is give them that wee bit of support to, to hopefully be better set up to prepare for those incidents, those negatives when they happen, because it's not really a case of if they happen anymore. Tried to, um, or I have shared with you some of our key messaging and themes to to help you. Hopefully, that makes cyber resilience and internet safety more accessible. It's device, platform, or it's person. And if it's device and platform, it's recognise, react, and be prepared to recover. And if it's the person, we want them being safe, smart, and kind. Um, and the last we part there, the resources in Digital Learn Scott, we've tried to pull together resources and information that are specific to each part, each strand of that um, consume, create and communicate. And we want you to think about that when you are working with children and young people in cyber resilience and safety, or indeed their families, is it, are they consuming, are they creating, are they communicating? And then you've got our toolkit to help point you towards resources that are hopefully useful and relevant to that behaviour. But that's everything for me. I hope it's been useful to you. Um, you can pop your um, ideas into the chat if you want to ask anything or challenge anything I've said there. Um, feel free to do that. I'm just going to grab the link here. It should be the right link to the evaluation. If you can give us a wee bit of feedback, that would be that would be great. Um, but that's everything from me. So if you want to go ahead and fill out that evaluation or give us any more feedback in the chat.